Thanks for joining me today for this discussion on ethanol defense multifunction fuel treatment for gasoline and ethanol blends from Bell Performance. My name is Eric Bjornstad. I'm the Technical Information Director here at Bell. And what we want to do today in our time together is we want to learn about a few things uh, related to the, this topic of ethanol gasoline, the problems that it uh, uh, creates out in the field, and the things you can do about those problems. So what we're going to learn today is we're going to learn about the problems that ethanol causes, and we're going to learn about uh, what ethanol defense from Bell Performance does to solve those problems. We're going to talk about how it works. We're going to uh, be able to define these in terms of benefits for the user when they use ethanol defense. So first thing we have to talk about is the fact that gasoline is not what it used to be. Really, you can say the same thing about diesel fuel. Um, it's, in, it's really in the same boat as well. But the big reason, well, one of the big reasons why gasoline is not what it used to be <clears throat> is that uh, they use more cracked feedstocks to make up the gasoline. Now, what we mean when we say that is um, uh, the worldwide demand for distillate fuels like gasoline and diesel keeps going up and up and up and up, especially when you have formerly third world countries like China and India, uh, you know, Singapore, Indonesia. You have those those countries essentially coming online and starting to to create demand for automotive fuels. So there's more demand, and uh, refineries have struggled to keep up with that demand. They can't they they can't just manufacture more oil out of the ground. So they have to figure out how to get more gas and diesel out of the oil that they find. And back in 1972, you took a barrel of gas of uh, crude oil you would get about half of it would be gas and diesel, and then the rest of it would be uh, what they call the residual fuel, so the heavy fuel oil and the stuff that's used mainly in industry and places like that. But through catalytic cracking processes, they've been able to increase that percentage to about 93% of oil now is able to be refined into gasoline and diesel distillate fuels. Now, on the face of it, that's a good thing. However, the gas and diesel that's made from uh, uh, as a result of that, that catalytic cracking process, um, it uh, chemically it's a little bit different. Um, it's got more double bonds in it because the catalytic cracking process is essentially involved taking big molecules that used to go into asphalt and breaking them up into small molecules that could now go into gas and diesel. But those small molecules are less stable and more reactive than the, you know, the virgin straight run gasoline and diesel molecules. So you've got gasoline that is uh, made from a lot of cracked stock and it's just not as stable. It doesn't have as long a storage life as gasoline from 20, 30, 40 years ago. So uh, in decades past, uh, gasoline storage life used to be at least a year or more. Now it's considerably less than that. And that's especially true if you look at the other big difference in how gas is now versus how it was back then, which is the introduction of ethanol and the blending of ethyl alcohol into the gasoline fuel supply. Ethanol, uh, for a number of reasons, also further shortens the life of gasoline. So when we talk about ethanol, we have to ask the question, why is it in there in the first place? Well, it's in there for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is because it's helped, it helps make up the octane rating of the gasoline. You know, gasoline uh, needs to have an, a, an adequate octane rating in order to function properly in an engine. <clears throat> and um, they've always, the refiners have always used uh, supplementary things to add to the gasoline to try and essentially raise the finished product to the minimum octane level that's needed. Um, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, it uh, used to be tetraethyl lead. That's why you would have leaded gasoline. Well, they started phasing that out in the late 70s because of the environmental problems. And so they, you know, they, had to, they had to replace it with something. 
So they started replacing it with uh, uh, this stuff called MTBE, methyl terbutyl ether. And this became a viable re uh, replacement. MTBE has an octane rating of between 115 and 130, depending on what source you look at. Um, so uh, all seemed to be well and good. Um, but uh, as with many things in life, things weren't nearly uh, 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 quite what they seem. The Clean Air Act of 1986 uh, created a federal mandate for the creation of what they call boutique fuels to try and improve air quality. Basically, it was a mandate from Congress that said you must change the composition of gasoline to make it burn cleaner and help the air quality. And so the way that they figured they would do that is they would start adding things to the fuel that increased the oxygen content of the fuel. Uh, logically, those things are called oxygenates, and there are any number of oxygenate compounds you could mix into fuel. So they started blending the oxygenates into gasoline to help satisfy the requirements, and that's one reason why MTBE was chosen, because it was could function as both an oxygenate and as uh, something that uh, helped make up the uh, the octane supply or the octane rating of the fuel. Um, uh, and, and basically, if you increase the oxygen content of the fuel, it will burn cleaner and it will produce less carbon monoxide and other harmful emissions. So that's good. But in the late 90s, they started finding that all this MTBE that they were blending in was leaking out into the water supply and contaminating it. So that had to go. And so they figured, well, we still have to uh, substitute it with something, and we have to substitute it with something that will do the same double duty that MTBE was doing. And the, uh, the, the thing that stepped to the front as the most viable replacement was uh, ethanol, ethyl alcohol. Now, when we say viable replacement, that's important because um, there are, you know, there's a hundred different things you could put into gasoline to increase its oxygen supply. Um, there are probably any number of other things that you could put in that would raise the octane of it. But if you're going to do this on any kind of national scale, then whatever you choose has to be able to be inexpensive. It has to be able to be easy to make in very large quantities. And it has to be easy to transport and relatively safe to handle. And there are not that many things that falls that fill all those criteria. Ethanol most certainly does fill all the, the, those uh, requirements. Now, before we talk about the, the, the problems that people associate with ethanol, one thing that we should point out is that um, people always blame the EPA for ethanol being in our gasoline. Uh, they, they kind of see it as a representative of governments, um, in their view, overarching, overreach into the private lives of citizens. But <clears throat> the EPA, actually, is not the one that's to blame here. Um, the, the EPA acts as the enforcement arm for the federal mandate, the Renewable Fuels Act mandate specifically. But uh, if you look at it, the Renewable Fuels Act, which is part of the Clean Air Act, is legislation that was drafted by Congress. So it is Congress, the Senate, and the House that are telling people they have to use ethanol. The EPA is just the messenger, so to speak. They're the enforcement arm. So um, for any gripes that people have with ethanol, it's not technically the EPA's fault. They're just the visible face of something that people don't like. So. Positives and negatives of ethanol. There are, uh, there's very, there are very few things in life that are 100% good and 100% bad. And even though ethanol gets a bad rap, it's got some positive things. So we figured to talk about a few of the positives and the negatives, kind of mix them together so, so we can get a better understanding of why it's being used uh, the, the, the positive things it brings to the table, and then, of course, a better explanation of the negatives. All right, number one, it's a renewable fuel. That's a positive, or it's viewed as a positive. <clears throat> that means that it is able, it is produced from renewable resources, i.e., it's made from plants. So it's made in the United States, we make it from corn. 
uh, in other areas of the world, like Brazil, Brazil makes it from sugarcane. And Brazil is very, very, very good at making large-scale amounts of ethanol. In fact, they've been doing that for long, much longer than we have. Um, so it's a renewable fuel, and that's a positive both in that you can make more of that fuel instead of having to pull it out of the ground, but it also helps politically because people have more environmental consciousness than they ever have before, and so people from a political standpoint, they like this idea of renewable fuels, especially if it's a renewable fuel made from something that's grown by American farmers instead of refined from oil that they perceive to have come from the Middle East or someplace like that. Uh, number two, it reduces emissions to help air quality. That's definitely a positive. That's the whole reason, one of the whole reasons why they put it in there in the first place. It increases the oxygen content of the fuel, and that means that supplying more oxygen during combustion, which means you're more likely to have uh, more complete combustion and less production of harmful uh, emissions like carbon monoxide and NOx gases. Um, number three, uh, which is the first negative, uh, ethanol contains less energy, so it, you get less mileage on it. Um, less energy because it's a smaller molecule. Uh, you know, when you're talking about fossil fuels, or really when you're talking about anything that's combusting, what burns is the carbon. So a large carbon molecule or a long carbon molecule that has 20 carbons in it, let's say, if you fully combust that, you're going to get a lot more heat energy out of that than a molecule that's got two or three or four carbons. And that's basically what we're looking at. Gasoline molecules tend to run between C4 and C8. Ethanol is C2. So it's got less energy. And so depending on the, uh, con the percentage in that gasoline, if it's 10%, what they call E10, you probably have 4 to 5% drop in mileage over regular gasoline. If it's E85 in a flex fuel vehicle, you could be talking 25, 30%. So less mileage uh, because it contains less energy. Um, ethanol attacks polymer components in older engines and fuel systems and small engines. Uh, this is a big negative. Um, it's uh well first let's let's say that um if you're running ethanol in your car and your car is less than uh let's say 20 years old you don't have to worry about its effects on the components in your car however they still haven't really mastered the the problem that if you use it in lawnmowers if you use it in small engines and if you use it in cars let's say classic cars and cars that are older than let's say the early 90s it has the potential to do some real damage and that's because uh, you know, the seals and the fuel system components, basically the rubber parts and the plastic parts, anything that's a polymer, those uh, uh, can be attacked by the ethanol, and the ethanol will dissolve over time some of those components and, and basically cause some real damage uh, in those. Right now, for the average person, the biggest uh, concern that they need to have in this regard is its effects in the small engines. Um, uh, it it's definitely causes an issue in lawnmowers and in you know, weed whackers and chainsaws and, and things like that. Um, another aspect of ethanol, which is a negative, is um, its susceptibility to phase separation. Now, this is one of the big, big problems with ethanol, is the fact that ethanol, uh, in whatever concentration you have it in, it attracts water from the environment. So if you have E10 gasoline, that 10% ethanol content in that gasoline is going to attract and want to absorb and pull water into the fuel blend. Now, all fuels have a certain ability to absorb and dissolve a certain amount of water. But um, there comes a, a, a tipping point, usually around half a percent of volume, when if that ethanol blend pulls in water that exceeds that amount, then it will cause the uh, alcohol to separate away from the gasoline. 
And so the alcohol actually mixes with the water, separates, and you get a layer of gasoline, and you get a layer of alcohol plus water. And that is bad news because that basically destroys the combustibility uh, and the octane rating of that fuel that's left behind. So that is a big problem uh, for ethanol blended fuels. Now this last point that we have there, uh, which is a negative, is uh, conf there's confusion about E10 versus E15 and who uses what. Okay, what we mean by that is um, the gasoline that you're most likely to get at the gas station to put in your car is 10%. Um, there are some states that have 15%. Now, 10% um, ethanol gasoline is approved, officially approved for use in just about any kind of engine, including marine engines, including um, uh, small engines, lawnmowers, things like that. That doesn't mean it's necessarily good for them, but they've done enough testing that they have, you know, they basically said, well, we're pretty sure that it's okay for those. But they are very clear in saying you should not put E15 or anything higher than 10% ethanol into any kind of into a generator, into a boat, into uh, you know any of this lawn equipment, anything like that, and that's because the higher concentration of ethanol is more likely to cause damage in those systems. So there's confusion there because most people don't really know that. You know, they they, they don't stay on top of fuel issues. They just go to the gas station, fill up their gas can in their car, and they leave. They think it's all the same. So um, the the small engine industry especially has been trying to, for the last couple of years, get the word out and caution people who, who buy their product, you know, the person who goes to Home Depot and buys a lawnmower, really try to use things like the uh, 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 Look Before You Pump campaign to try and stress to them, remember, don't put anything higher than 10% ethanol into this piece of equipment. Uh, or you could it be have the potential for some real problems. Now, um, we've said that uh, gasoline of today doesn't store anywhere near as long as it used to. And you remember we said the first reason is because it's made from catalytic crack stocks, and the second reason is because a lot of it has ethanol in it. And ethanol space separation problem does make it a lot more difficult to store ethanol blend gasoline for the amounts of time that you used to be able to store gas. Again, the ethanol, it absorbs the water, water will cause phase separation, and then you've got bad gas. Um, and one thing to stress about the octane rating, remember we said that one reason they put ethanol in gasoline is because it's got a high octane rating, so it helps it helps them make up the final amount of octane need they need to have in the fuel. <clears throat> so if they have to have an 87 octane gasoline, they might say, well, we have to have an 87 octane, but we also have to put 10% uh, of ethanol in it. Now, um, just you know, off the top of my head, let's say that 10%. Uh, they, let's say that they know that 10% ethanol content will add three points of octane. So the, if they know that, they can take an 84 base gasoline, you know, 90%. Add 10% uh, ethanol, and they add the extra three points there, and they've got 87 octane, and problem solved. So, if that 87 octane undergoes phase separation because it's been stored and absorbs water, then let's say that half of that ethanol drops out because it doesn't all drop out at once. It's a process that happens over time. So let's say that half of the ethanol drops out. Well that's technically going to be one and a half points of octane, but it's actually going to be more than that because while the ethanol was blended into that fuel, it it dissolved and, and solvated what they, you know, kind of fancy chemistry word there, it solvated uh, certain organic components of that fuel that would normally, in a normal situation, help uh, contribute to the octane rating of the fuel. When that ethanol drops out, it takes that stuff with it. And so instead of losing one and a half points, maybe you lose two and a half or three and a half or more, depending on how much drops out. So the ethanol 
phase separating away from the gasoline really does a number on the the, the fuel quality of the gasoline that's left behind, and in many cases will make it almost uh, unusable. So that's why it's a big problem to store ethanol gasoline. All right, so those are the problems. Now let's talk about the kinds of people that tend to use ethanol and the kinds of things that they might be concerned about. I mean, there's a lot of people that will use ethanol, but um, different different markets, shall we say, different markets, uh, industries, however you want to put it, not everybody's concerned about the same thing. Okay, consumers, typical consumers who use ethanol gasoline, what are they most concerned about? Well, they want better mileage, um, and they don't want it to destroy their lawn equipment because they don't want to have to keep going back to Home Depot to buy another two, three, four hundred dollar lawnmower or weed whacker. Uh, municipalities that have gas-powered equipment, well, they are concerned about damage that it might do to their small equipment, and if they store it at all, they're concerned about its fuel storage health. Uh, fleets, private fleets, we should say, they're typically going to be kind of rare. Um, most fleets use diesel, so there's not a whole lot of, 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 of large fleets of gasoline vehicles out there in the private sector. Um, consumer marine, people who own boats, well, they are concerned about the gasoline absorbing too much water and causing damage in their boats, and they are concerned about the fact that they're not really supposed to run on E15 gasoline. All right, so um, the kind of solution, historic solutions that Bell Performance has had. Bell Performance has had a multifunction treatment for gasoline for decades called Mixigo. It was formulated by Robert Bell in 1927, which was the year that he was able to uh, uh, perfect a surfactant that he was able to use to take water and mix it into uh, petroleum fuel and keep it together, make it mix together. So, uh, Mixigo has been Bell Performance's uh, you know, stock multifunction uh, gasoline treatment for years, and it was used for years and decades by people. It was used in ethanol blends for a long time. You know, in the 1970s, when we had the gas crisis, people started using more ethanol. Uh, Mixigo, people were putting Mixigo in there. So uh, Mixigo has always been an effective uh, treatment for ethanol. But in 2010, Bell Performance came up with another formulation. Uh, basically, we took the Mixigo formulation, we took some of those components, and we beefed up some other aspects of it and rebranded it as Ethanol Defense. Now, so 2010, Ethanol Defense comes out, and Ethanol Defense is really the best formulation that Bell Performance has to address all of the concerns that all of those kinds of groups we just talked about, to address all of those concerns that those people have when they're using ethanol blended gasoline. So what does it do for them? Well, uh, it has a combustion improver in it. Uh, which helps you get better mileage. It has, very importantly, it has detergency for fuel injectors and combustion chambers. Detergency is probably, if you had to pick one thing in a fuel additive, whether it's gas or diesel, if you had to pick one thing that was most important, uh, that is the thing that's most important, the detergency. Uh, you have to keep the fuel injectors clean. You have to keep the combustion chambers clean. Um, and you can get some really good mileage gains just by keeping, just by cleaning those things up. So ethanol defense has detergency to help keep, to help clean them and then keep them clean over time. It has commercial grade water control and stabilizers. And now for ethanol fuels, this is very important uh, because the, the, the water controlling element in ethanol defense will actually help the ethanol fuel resist fuel uh, phase separation more than if it wasn't in there. Um, fourth thing, it has protection for these rubber and polymer parts, protection from ethanol damage. It contains a, a soluble protectant that basically lays down a barrier protection for those parts and helps, helps interrupt the, 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 the solvent contact that the uh, ethanol fuel has that damages these parts. Um, 
So it has all of those things, and it's uh, all put together in a, a, a an economical, concentrated formulation that's used at a 1 to 1,000 tree rate. All right, so each of these things, just a little bit more about them. The combustion prover gives you better gas mileage and better fuel economy, which helps restore some of that lost mileage difference we talked about earlier when we said that using ethanol gas lowers your mileage. And of course, some of the mileage improvement is also gained as a result of keeping the engine clean. Uh, detergency and restored octane. Okay, like we just said a minute ago, fuel injector detergency is probably the number one factor that uh, the, the, the number one factor that a fuel additive will be able to positively impact your mileage with. Um, the, the detergency that's in ethanol defense, it will also clean up dissolved polymers that are absorbed by ethanol. Now, that's something we haven't really talked about before. We said, we've said that ethanol damages engines by absorbing uh, uh, or dissolving polymer parts. Now, uh, as the fuel moves through the system, the tendency to happen is that the, it, will, it will essentially move those from one part, deposit them in another part. Um, and so those become then unwanted deposits in areas they're not supposed to be in. That's all defense. Detergent seed that comes in that formulation will help clean those parts out and help uh, essentially keep them from building up in areas that they are not supposed to build up in. Um, and that last point about helps restore proper octane rating, um, that is, uh, that, that, that's something interesting that not, not a lot of people know about. Um, uh, uh, what they have found is that if you take a new car that has an engine that's uh, engineered to run at a certain octane, and you run it, um, and then you measure the octane requirement of that engine, what they find is that uh, in as little as the first three, 4,000 miles, the octane requirement for the engine to keep running uh, uh, at the same efficiency as before actually goes up. And that's because you get deposits that build up in the combustion chamber and on the piston crown around here. And anytime you have a deposit in here, that changes the volume of space in here, and that changes the octane requirement. So if you can clean those deposits out, if you can clean them out, you can restore the space to what it was when the car was new, and you uh, essentially lower the octane requirement for that engine back to what it used to be when it was new. Um, Again, these are two injectors. Uh, it's very, very important to keep injectors clean if you want your engine to run well. You can gain as much as 4 or 5% in mileage just by keeping your injectors clean because um, it is impossible for an engine to run at its best efficiency, and it's impossible for fuel to combust at its best efficiency if it is not being atomized uh, and sprayed into the uh, combustion chamber uh, uh, as well as it was designed to be, essentially. Water control, absorption, stabilization control, um, all things that ethanol offense delivers, it solves the, uh, the, the phase separation issue and it prolongs phase separation from happening so that you can have improved storage of the ethanol blended fuels. It also contains a fuel stabilizer along with dispersants and antioxidants that work together to improve the storage life of the ethanol blend. So it really was formulated to be a, uh, a, a, a multifunction treatment that, that addresses all major ethanol gasoline issues. Same here, protects against ethanol corrosiveness and solvency. We talked about that earlier. It's got a fuel solvent uh, soluble lubricant that protects the rubber and plastic parts from this, this, this dissolving attack by the, uh, the, the ethanol fuel. Um, it protects small engine from, engines from damage. I mean, you get a lot of things like uh, corrosion uh, in carburetor ports and things like that with small engines. They will protect those parts and keep that from happening. And of course, the water controller in ethanol defense helps blunt 
the 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 storage corrosion problem where uh, anytime there's free water present in a storage tank you will get just water related corrosion well the water controller in ethanol defense helps to uh, kind of keep that from happening so that's what ethanol defense does who are the people who are most likely to be interested in using it well um, the first group, of course, are consumers, and we don't have them listed here because they're they're kind of an assumed market. Um, you know, it's it, it it does great things to treat ethanol uh, gasoline for the average car and truck, and so the B to C market, the business to consumer market, with uh, uh, just your typical gas using consumers. Uh, they are a, a, a primary and obvious market for people who will be interested in ethanol defense. On the business side, any municipality and company that has a gas-powered fleet would benefit from ethanol defense. Um, both private sector and public sector entities that have large amounts of small equipment that run on gas definitely can use ethanol defense. Police fleets are another one. They kind of fall in here. But uh, Bell Performance has done a lot of business with police fleets in Central Florida. Um, and police fleets, cars that run on gas, uh, definitely a market for ethanol defense. Now, as we wind this down, um, we talked a lot about all the great things that ethanol defense does and all the problems that it solves. And what you should be saying, what you should be thinking is, yeah, but what makes it different? Doesn't everybody else do that too? Why, you know, uh, how is it really different from all this other stuff that I see out in the marketplace? And that is a fair question. Um, on the Bell Performance website, we have a number of, of comparative studies and infographics that we have produced, not just on ethanol defense, but on other things that we offer, like diesel and marine diesel and, and uh, things like that. Uh, this is one example. This is a uh, uh, infographic, comparative infographic that was put together to show functionally how ethanol defense compares to some of the popular treatments that people see out in the marketplace. So you have ethanol defense, Startron is very popular, Seafoam is very popular. Amsoil is more well known for making uh, oil, but uh, because the market is there, they have branched out into uh, uh, ethanol additives. STP, probably the best known name out there in the marketplace. And Stable, stable again, famous for making diesel stabilizers, but have they've come out? They've recognized the demand in the market and have come out with an ethanol fuel treatment. And uh, if you if you break down both what they claim to do, and then also if you look at like uh, what's listed on their MSDS, and if you start reading between the lines and trying to draw some conclusions that you can make, what you find is that none of them do uh, or have all of the positive traits that ethanol defense does. Most of them claim to, to increase mileage. Um, some of them claim to prevent ethanol damage. Some of them, all of them claim to remove water, but the problem here is that uh, most of them, like Startron and Seafoam and these two, Stable and, and Amsoil Quickshot, they use alcohol to do it. And you can't solve an alcohol problem with by adding more alcohol. Uh, you need a non-alcoholic uh, water remover to properly combat and solve ethanol problems. And the only two that have it are ethanol defense and actually STP. Um, they all have claim detergency. Um, four of the six uh, seem to be able to prevent ethanol phase separation. Um, and then, of course, ethanol defense is the only one that's backed by over 100 years of experience. And then, lastly, for all of these things that they do, you have to look and see how much does it take to accomplish all that. I mean, it's one thing if you've got something that can do 15 different things, but if it costs $500 to do it, well, it's not worth it. And tree rate is what directly impacts um, the, the cost to use, basically. So uh, once you uh, uh, start 
stacking them up side by side and, and doing some real research into what they actually do as opposed to what they claim to do, it's pretty clear that uh, we've been able to formulate ethanol defense to be the uh, uh, ethanol treatment that does more for less than any of these others. So that's how it stacks up to the competition. And with that, that brings us to the end of our discussion here today. Um, if we were doing this in a live format, this would be the time when we would uh, start taking questions from those in attendance. However, you are most likely watching this remotely or on video, so there's nobody there to ask questions. So uh, we've got my email up here on the screen. Uh, I am Eric Bjornstad, so my email is ebjornstad at bellperformance.net. So if you have any questions, what I would encourage you to do is to email them to me. Um, uh, send me an email at that address. Uh, mention that you were watching the, the ethanol defense training and that you have some questions. And I will be more than happy to answer those to you and hopefully get you the answers that you need. So that wraps it up for today. Thanks very much for joining me as we talked about ethanol problems and ethanol defense fuel treatment from Bell Performance. Uh, I'm Eric Bjornstad again with Bell Performance. Uh, thanks very much for joining me. And uh, I'll say have a nice day. Bye-bye.